Okay, so Mr. Gottfried, let's start with the big question. What is American identity in the 21st century? And how do Charlottesville, Ferguson, BLM, and all the other street conflicts that have happened over the last few years factor into this big equation? You know, when I looked at your question, I was thinking, you know, this question beats me. Uh, it's very hard for me to find any kind of core identity which is left in this country uh, outside of the availability of consumer goods, um, a certain kind of uh, standardized education, which doesn't reach everybody, but I would suppose it, uh, uh, it reaches most people, and it comes through the media as well, and uh, through our culture as well as through the formal educational system, um, and it stresses uh, universalism, uh, equality, human rights, um, and the need to integrate all people in a, uh, uh, a just pluralistic society. So I, I th uh, the English language, I suppose, is there, but uh, it, it is not something which is emphasized uh, as part of a core American identity. You mentioned that America seems divided, but hasn't America always been divided? You know, between Federalists and Anti-Federalists, North and South, Democrats, Republicans. Isn't this just part of the American way of doing things? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's fair, however, to compare the... Uh, disagreements between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists to the degree of divisiveness that you see in the United States now. After all, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists um, all came out of a shared ancestry. Uh, they were predominantly Protestants. Uh, they were churched. Um, they, uh, uh, they accepted certain political givens. Uh, they agreed to live by the Constitution, although the Anti-Federalists accepted it somewhat reluctantly. Um, and I think, despite their differences, the country was very united. Um, the Civil War, of course, did represent a, a major break, sort of a fracture um, in the body and social politic. Um, but there were efforts afterwards made to heal that. Um, I think as late as the 1950s, uh, there was at least some effort to sort of paste together an American identity based on Americanism. Um, and uh, a general feeling of religiosity and American political and cultural superiority. Um, I think by the 1960s, those sources of unity had eroded. Um, and I think what you see today is, uh, represents the excesses of pluralism um, and very deep ideological divisions uh, among groups that do not really share very much in common. Okay, well, the past is the past. Regardless of what happened, here we are now, and we have a crisis of identity in America. So how do we fix this problem? Yeah, I'm not sure how you cure it, by the way. Uh, I, I'm always accused of being a profoundly pessimistic writer uh, who should serve uh, razor blades with his book so people can commit suicide after they finish. Um, uh, I, I don't know what, what, what went wrong, and I, I think part of it was in the 1950s, there really wasn't that much holding America together. We look back and it seems somewhat superficial. Um, I, I'm not going to say that America was unjust or it was sexist or homophobic or this. Every society in the history of the world has made gender distinctions, has uh, uh, frowned on homosexuality, has favored marriage, typically favored patriarchy. Uh, so I don't think the United States was... Uh, uh, grievously unjust and has fallen apart because of its injustices. I just don't think there was that much glue holding it together. I think part of the problem is that the pluralism, which is accepted as an official political doctrine enforced by a very large public administration taught in the schools, doesn't really rest on much in the end except some kind of changing American creed based on some proposition that all of us in some sense are equal and that we enjoy the benefits of American citizenship. Um, of course, on the other hand, you see ethnic nations in Europe that are now divided because they've, uh, they uh, are divided by cultural, moral conflicts, many of which, by the way, I think are imported from the United States. Uh, there's no question that American cultural as well as political and economic hegemony uh, has had an effect uh, on uh, Western European democracies. Uh, and I suspect that to some degree the struggles that are going on there have been exported from the United States or reflect American influence. 
So where did this Americanization of Europe come from? Was it all part of the Marshall Plan? And if so, why is Eastern Europe still remaining so different from the West? Well, I, I think, as, you know, as I argue in a trilogy that I wrote on the development of the American managerial state um, and its international repercussions, uh, American power that is projected by the end of World War II is so great um, that it not only is a, uh, now I'm talking about political predominance, but there also is cultural predominance, European study in American universities, they read American books. The Marshall Plan is only, you know, represents the, the, ice, the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of American influence. Um, one, one of the figures that I come up with uh, in, in one of my books is that uh, Europeans are something like 50 times more likely to read an American book than Americans are to read a European book. Um, uh, and probably the same is true of movies, television programs. So I, I think American cultural influence becomes dominant. Um, this is not because we are morally superior or even producing you know, greater artists or writers. Uh, it's because uh, our economic, political influence and our media influence is so powerful throughout the Western world. Now, Eastern Europe, of course, is different because they live under Soviet control and they are less liberalized and westernized to begin with. And therefore, Eastern Europe has been spared many of the effects uh, of the cultural and uh, social divisiveness that is besetting Western European democracies, the, the Anglosphere, uh, countries influenced by English, uh, Anglo-American civilization, and of course the United States. Well, again, if America is so culturally dominant, then why does it seem to be rotting away in front of our eyes? Well, I, I, th I think there, there are really two dynamics at work here. Number one, the left, as I've argued, uh, in this book here on fascism, which seems to be selling very well in Eastern Europe uh, and in other works that I've read, the left is inherently totalitarian. Uh, they believe they can create a perfect society uh, uh, and believe in public administration and education as vehicles uh, to achieve the, the kind of world that they want all of us to live in. The right is primarily reactionary, it reacts against what the left is doing um, and I would argue that since the demise of fascism, there really has not been any kind of rightist ideology that has frontally challenged the left. Um, in the United States, the left is pretty much the only ideology, um, uh, unless you want to include the, uh, uh, the movement around Trump, which is largely, it's largely inchoate. Um, and it really does not have any kind of worldview, coherent worldview that holds it together. So the left holds the good cards. Um, it, it has a vision that it wishes to impose on all of us. It's inherently totalitarian. Um, and uh, although for a while it had to pretend to be uh, tolerant in order to gain power, I remember this in the 1950s, every member of the Communist Party in the United States was talking about uh, First Amendment rights and freedom. Once, once they've achieved power, uh, they don't have to be tolerant anymore. Uh, they, they do not believe in 19th century liberal values. They despise 19th century liberal values. Uh, and now they have the opportunity to just uh, dispense with them uh, and finish up their enemies. So, uh, you know, and uh, if you take a look at who was, there's not very much really opposing them, seriously opposing them. Uh, so, you know, they can just keep going. Um, the, uh, uh, there is a conservative movement in the United States, but it generally goes along. It represents the weakest possible opposition that I could imagine. Uh, they are, I think, rightly afraid of a populist movement on the right. Um, but even that movement uh, has nothing like the media power or educational influence that is available to the left. I have to be honest with you. I have a very large percent of my friends and family who believe hardcore in the liberal agenda. They are for their whole LGBT thing, their Black Lives Matter, their boohoo, feel bad for certain groups sort of uh, way of doing things. But so what does this say about America? Because I'll tell you what, in Russia, this type of person is very marginal. Well, I don't know, I don't know who your friends are, but uh, I think all, all lives should matter. Um, the, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think, has, you know, has a kind of auxiliary role 
uh, in terms of the anti-fascist left. Uh, they're sort of brought on, you know, in, in uh, uh, kind of walk-on role, but uh, I think their influence is vastly exaggerated. We were talking about Charlottesville before. I didn't notice too many black people there. Um, I, I think Black Lives Matter representatives were probably relatively insignificant to us. And mostly white anti-fascist activists who are running around and screaming, uh, supposedly guided by noble impulse. Um, so the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter is, uh, I think, something which is largely pushed and funded by, by the white left. Um, and it is used to radicalize blacks as part of a general radical uh, uh, effort by the left to radicalize, galvanize society, and to shame white people, which I think is integral to the strategy of the left. That's a pretty big statement you just made, so uh, I've got to ask a follow-up question here. So why exactly would white Americans be in a war against white Americans to destroy white Americans? What's the point? That is a very good question. Although I've written books on the subject, I remain profoundly puzzled by what I'm seeing. Um, but I, I think there are groups on the white, uh, among whites, uh, on the left, who feel alienated, profoundly alienated from other le uh, uh, other people on the white. They would include homosexuals, lesbians, uh, to, to transgender, of course, transgendered people. Um, and just about anyone who feels excluded by what they see as white Anglo-Saxon predominance in the United States. And of course, that predominance hasn't existed for a very, very long time, but they continue to react against it. And obviously, women uh, who think that they've been the victim of a patriarchal society will identify themselves with, uh, uh, with, with the anti-fascist left, which also happens to be anti-white. Um, and if you notice, there's a double standard here that uh, whereas they express nothing but scorn for Christians uh, uh, for being sexist, homophobe, whatever else, that throughout the Western world, the anti-fascist left and the left generally welcomes Muslims, however abusively they treat women. It doesn't matter because they're not going to be judged by the same standards. But obviously what you see at work here is an extreme form uh, of masochism, uh, which I, th uh, but I, I think in the case of many people who are on the left, they do not perceive this as masochism because they feel resentment against some other group that is identified with white privilege or Anglo-Saxon Protestant predominance. So are you trying to say that before World War II, the West saw itself as being better than everyone else and that that was a good thing? But now, after World War II, the West still sees itself as being better than everyone else, but that that's awful, and that's a sin that needs to be atoned for, that the playing field needs to be leveled? Is that what you mean? That, that's a very good point. I mean, there's no question that in 1914, the Western world saw itself at the height of all human civilization, not only because of its science, but because of what today we would say was bourgeois civilization. It had a an educated middle class that led, it, it believed in religious freedom, um, intellectual freedom of a kind that's not even imaginable in Western democracies today. Um, I am always uh, amused when I hear Germans saying this is the freest of all German societies. The hell it is. There's less intellectual freedom in Germany today than there was in the Weimar Republic, certainly in the German Second Empire. Uh, it is not at all. It, it, it may have a little more intellectual freedom than East Germany did under the communists. And even that, I think, is questionable. Uh, so in many ways, you know, Europe or the Western world, including the United States in 1914, really is standing at the height of civilization. And I think much of its sense of self-worth was justified, although obviously it carried this a bit too far. But even after the Second World War, you know, into the 1950s, this feeling existed in a superficial way, although I think it was transferred to a sense of American superiority. Uh, the world, the America I grew up in the 1950s really thought it was standing also at the height of human civilization. Uh, and then in the 1960s, you could see how brittle, you know, the civilization became culturally and uh, educationally and in other ways, although we continue to dominate economically, uh, although not quite as, uh, as strongly as we had in the 1950s. Well, you've been talking about the complete and total dominance of American politics by the left, 
But doesn't America have a two-party system? I mean, there are people who vote conservative in America. I mean, doesn't there sort of have to be a default right in America in the two-party system? Yeah, I, I hear it too. I would make a distinction. There's something called the conservative movement, which is not even conservative. Uh, you just have people being wait, waiting to be bought up by the New York Times or, you know, allowed to come on to CNN. And it's sort of represented by National Review or Fox News. Uh, you meet very few people who are genuinely on the right. They tend to be centrist, and on social issues, they, uh, they incline probably more toward the left than the right. Um, and for a long time, and these people are closely identified with establishment Republicans who are disliked clearly by the left, but not really hated with the same venom or passion that is vented on Donald Trump and his supporters. Trump and his supporters are different. They are not part of something called the conservative movement. They represent a certain kind of right-wing populism. They're not in favor of large corporations, although a lot of corporate heads have uh, been in the Trump administration, uh, and Trump himself comes out of the corporate world. But the, the populist movement that he heads, or which is identified with him, um, is not really pro-big pro business. Uh, they tend to be socially conservative, much more so than the conservative movement generally is. They despise both the establishment Republicans and the establishment Democrats. And I think they do represent whatever there is of a right in the United States. They probably can count on, you know, 35 to 40 percent of the electorate, no more than that. Uh, and some of these some of these people do vote Republican, but they uh, will more readily identify themselves with Trump. So I think the real division we are looking at is the anti-fascist left, the rest of the left, you know, and the populist, what there is of a, an incipient populist right in the United States, which is different from the conservative movement and establish, different from establishment Republicans. Now, what's been happening over the last few years in America to Russian eyes? Looks like the beginning of a revolution or some sort of uh, American Maidan of sorts. Do you think that there's any validity to that Russian view of American events? Or is that just sort of uh, wishful thinking by certain Russian patriots? Oh, no, no. I think it is much more serious. I think the Russians may be right on this one. No, I, I, I think the divisions are extre go extremely deep. Um, and what we have not seen yet is the Trump populist right taking to the streets and behaving like the anti-fascists. It could happen. One of the things that is... I think keeping the right from becoming more demonstrative is the conservative movement, uh, uh, which tells them, you know, uh, we have to be good establishment Republicans, we have to play by the rules, and don't be like these naughty people on the left, and they're really not all that bad, they have noble impulses, they're just acting out a little too much, and if we defeat the Democrats, that should be enough. But I, I think the point will be reached where you do see people on the right not listening to this anymore. And they will not be, uh, you know, the, uh, the white supremacist adolescents who are screaming in the streets and aligned with neo-Nazis. These will be more serious people. And uh, they, they, uh, they will start fighting the, the anti-fascist left. I think this is going to happen. And I think the outcome is not going to be pretty. Um, uh, either the left wins, at least in the short term, it's almost like the Spanish Civil War, you know, they, the first phase, the left may win. Uh, the, the right does not have, however, the media power or the social respectability of the left, including the anti-fascist left. Uh, so the, uh, uh, what calls itself the movement as opposed to the resistance, and the movement, uh, the movement consists of the Trump populace, it's not the conservative movement. And then the resistance is on the left. Uh, the movement does not have the kind of media and educational influence that the left enjoys. But I, I do think that all of this can result in, uh, uh, in nasty eruptions of violence. So how does America solve its crisis of identity? Or is there a crisis at all? Maybe the news networks just uh, need something to fill airtime. No, I, I think there really is a crisis. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, how it will be overcome. Um, we're not going to return in any case to anything in the past. And I say this as an historian who believes, uh, you know, like the German political theorist Carl Schmitt, that historical truths are true only once. <laughs> 
and you, you don't really go back to the past, um, uh, except in a very limited sense. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> uh, so, but I, I don't see us ever returning to the 1950s, and certainly not to 1900. Um, and you know, I would have liked an earlier American society. We're not going to go back. Uh, and I'm not sure. I'm not so sure that what comes out of the present conflict will look very pretty. Um, but you know, I think when people talk about a crisis, uh, uh, dramatic confrontations in America, uh, they are describing political and social realities. So, is there really nothing that we could tell a black welder, an unemployed white guy, and a feminist that would bring them all into one American identity together? Um, at this point, probably not. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I wish I could give you solutions. I can't. Uh, I, I think the divisions go very, very deep. Um, and, you know, the, the welder may get a job. I don't know if uh, the economy continues to improve. And it does seem to be improving since Trump took office, uh, although there is no evidence that wages have risen very much. But, you know, the unemployment problem has gone down. Uh, we now have a pipeline, and a large oil pipeline that should help to generate more, um, uh, uh, more, more commerce and uh, more wealth. Uh, but in, ter in terms of the deep cultural conflicts, I really don't, don't see anything happening. Um, I, I, if I had to place my uh, money on uh, or bet on one of the horses, uh, I would bet on the left. Um, at least, as I said, in the short run, or the, may, maybe the you know the uh, uh, maybe a little longer than that. But uh, you know, I think the right is going to come back. I think you you know you are still dealing with about forty percent of the population on the right, and they may not be well educated, and they may be, look like you know what Hillary calls deplorables. Uh, but there's quite a few of them out there. I live among them, and uh, I think many of them have very just grievances, and they are absolutely right. Uh, to be offended by the uh, by the rapid social changes and uh, marital and marital relations, gender relations, everything that has been largely imposed by the state in the last twenty to thirty years. So you know I can understand their anger, um, and I think these um, uh, these protesters on the right will be around for a very long time. Well, as someone who grew up in Cleveland, uh, everything was very divided uh, into black and white camps. Basically, no matter what race or ethnicity you were, there were sort of two cultures you had the choice of joining for the most part. Uh, obviously, your skin tone uh, made a big factor in that decision, but uh, c'est la vie. But over the last uh, so 20 or 30 years, the question of uh, the rise of Latino America has really changed the game. So how does this new growing Latino population in America alter American identity? Yeah, I, I, I think that there is a Latino, a Latino identity. I think you're absolutely right. At one point, you know, people came from other societies and they tried to blend in um, and they did not express grievances as oppressed ethnic minorities. But now they do because the state public administration encourages this. Educational institutions encourage this uh, so that um, uh, the Democratic Party is the party of identitarian politics. They play to ethnic grievances. Um, at one time, American Jews were very proud to be, you know, Jews in America or be Americans. Now, uh, you know, they associate uh, America with white Christians, which mean the Holocaust or something like that. But uh, I, I, I think these grievances have been largely encouraged by the state, the media, and culture, the popular culture. Um, and I don't think they're going to go away. Uh, and these people, you know, the people who, who express these grievances or who are told they should feel grievances uh, become, you say, part of the, the larger force uh, that, you know, is um, uh, uh, sympathetic to the anti-fascist left. Uh, and the state itself is sympathetic to the anti-fascist left. Uh, since what the anti-fascist left is going to ask the state to do in the end is to assume more power to fight prejudice and discrimination and to socialize people and control their speech and their thought. So there's nothing the anti-fascist uh, left is doing that's inimical to public administration um, or to identity politics. Uh, anti-fascist left thrives on identity politics. <laughs>